In the early 70s, a young Satoshi Tajiri, affectionately dubbed Dr. Bug by his friends, spent his childhood days exploring rural Japan in search of a myriad of weird and wonderful creatures to add to his collection. In the early 2000s, a young Austin Ashworth, along with many others his age, spent his childhood days growing a similar collection of creatures. My adventures may have taken place through a screen, while squeezed three to a seat on the school bus, sprawled out in the shade during the lazy summer months, or under the covers way past my bedtime, but the Pokemon video games capture the experience perfectly. This was Tajiri's goal when he and his team at Game Freak envisioned the first Pokemon games. As he witnessed his hometown undergo an urban transformation, and observed the birth of a new generation that preferred to spend their time indoors, Tajiri was inspired to share his childhood memories in a way the youth of the day could latch onto. With a million to one chance of success, a small group of underdogs set out to make these dreams a reality. I don't need to finish this story, right? Once the match was lit, Pokemania spread like wildfire throughout Japan and the Western world in the years that followed the 1998 original release. In this case, the years that followed actually brings us all the way to the modern day. Pokemon is as popular as ever, over a quarter century on. With this retrospective, I hope to examine how such humble beginnings grew into the highest grossing media franchise of all time. In doing so, I ask you to forget about the legacy of the franchise, and focus only on the first set of games as they would have been perceived at the time of release. The Japanese video game industry has an irritating habit of repackaging enhanced versions of existing games to entice the double dip. As you are all too well aware, Pokemon is no stranger to this strategy. Jaded parents were no doubt frustrated by the move to release an enhanced Pokemon Yellow version only a year after the original Pokemon Red and Blue hit storefronts. They should take comfort that Nintendo of America didn't follow the Japanese release cadence of not one, but two enhanced versions. The original Pocket Monsters Red and Green were followed by an updated Pocket Monsters Blue, before the further enhanced Pocket Monsters Yellow version. Excusing the obvious greed behind this move, it does provide an easy choice for which version to play today. Pokemon Yellow is the definitive Generation 1 title, and will be the main focus of this video. The core experience is largely unchanged from Red and Blue, so it's not a terribly important distinction, and the majority of my discussion is relevant to all three games. Disclaimer before we really dive in. Generation 1 was before my time. I grew up with Generation 3 on the Game Boy Advanced. I also posit Fire Red and Leaf Green are the best way to experience Kanto if you aren't looking to relive the original jank. I assure you this is independent of my own personal nostalgia. These remakes perfectly polish and preserve the magic of classic Pokemon, and come highly recommended by yours truly. With that out of the way, let's return our focus to the original Generation 1 titles. Few trainers will ever forget the memory of picking their first starter Pokemon. Within the opening minutes of the game, players are already faced with a crucial decision that will have lasting repercussions upon not just the rest of their playthrough, but on their very identity outside of the games. Charmander stands were able to sniff out the Squirtle Squad from across the playground, and intense rivalries were formed between the two factions. Us Bulbasaur loyalists, connoisseurs of true taste, just watched from the sidelines, silently judging whilst taking comfort in the superiority of our little plant boy. All jokes aside, the decision is an incredibly difficult one. All three are adorable, yet grow into fearsome beasts that every kid would want by their side. The perfect combo of cute and cool. I could just go on and on about how much I love all three starters. There isn't a weak link among them, and they form such a classic core for the original Pokemon lineup. This momentous day also brings with it the introduction of our childhood rival, Professor Oak's grandson. I'll refer to him as Blue to appease the broader fanbase, but personally he'll always be Gary to me. Regardless, his basis is found in the simple yet effective archetype of the snarky, brashly overconfident brat. From the very onset, he's convinced that he's the greatest trainer alive, and can't wait to prove it to the world. His competitive spirit is established immediately. Rather than an emotional approach, he has a calculated tactic to his starter selection, opting for whichever is advantageous to your pick. If you choose paper, he's going scissors. The game constantly keeps Blue one step ahead of the player, and our frequent clashes with him are always a challenge. They seem to invariably come at our weakest moment. Say what you want about the attitude, but he's got the skills and determination to back it up. His catchphrase, smell you later, is the cherry on top, 
You can't help but love to hate him. By far the largest difference Pokemon Yellow brings lies with how your starter is handled. Yellow recognizes how impossible the choice is, and allows the player to add all three to their team at various points in the game. This is a bit of a double-edged sword because the three starters are also universally popular that pretty much every Pokemon Yellow player is going to have a very similar lineup to their team. While this makes my in-game team a little less interesting, it does nothing to diminish the awesomeness that Venusaur, Charizard, and Blastoise effortlessly command. Don't worry, I'll find some way to spice it up with my remaining slots. Series mascot Pikachu assumes the starter role in their stead, but this is no ordinary Pikachu. It is, in fact, a very special Pikachu. See? It says it right here on the box. Inspired by Ash's companion, this Pikachu prefers to follow you around on foot rather than be confined in a Pokeball. Having your adorable buddy bopping along behind you may seem like a trifling gimmick, but it is super effective at fostering a bond between Pokemon and Trainer. Remember, in these early games, your interactions with your team begin and end with their utility in battle. The ability to check Pikachu's mood and reactions throughout your adventure is an important step in establishing Pokemon as friends rather than tools. Your rival begins his adventure with an Eevee, an arguably perfect fit for a starter when you consider its split elemental evolutions. Pokemon Yellow, modeled after the hit TV adaptation, sprinkles other little easter eggs throughout which will delight anime fans. Trainers, encounter rates, and sprites have all been adjusted to match Ash's established journey. Jesse and James even make surprise appearances, in place of generic grunts. Regardless of which game you are playing, the first steps outside Pallet Town are similar. We travel north to Viridian City and retrieve a package for Professor Oak. Upon delivering it, we are introduced to a primary objective of the game, completing the Pokedex. There exist 151 Pokémon hidden within the games. Some are so common you'll be sick of them, while others are limited to a single encounter per save file, or not catchable at all without help from friends. The rarest Pokémon of all, Mew, was added to the games in secret. Having never seen this mythical Pokémon with their own eyes, many players refused to believe it even existed at all. Mew was exclusively awarded to lucky contest winners in extremely limited quantities. Any trainer with one in their possession was the envy of the schoolyard. 151 Pokémon may seem trivial compared to the bloated roster of the modern era, but attempting to complete the Pokédex in the first generation games proves no small feat and will keep players engaged for hundreds of hours. Our fledgling adventure reaches a roadblock at Viridian Forest, intended as the first test of a trainer's ability. The game fills the space between towns with simple paths filled with generic NPC trainers. Occasionally, these punching bags will deliver a flash of personality in their dialogue, but overall these are a slog to get through. It's advisable to battle each trainer in order to keep your team properly leveled, but rarely are these fights difficult. The game challenges your patience more than anything. A forced battle against six Caterpie that all die in one hit can only be described as mindless filler. In areas like these early routes, brushes with wild Pokémon are reserved to patches of tall grass. Anyone with any degree of JRPG experience will recognize this as the godsend it truly is. Unwanted encounters serve only to slow the game's pace to a crawl. Once interrupted, an absolute minimum of 10 seconds is wasted if the player flees the fight instantly. Even with such battles limited to tall grass, you'll still be forced to face off against many, many wild Pokémon throughout your adventure. Between the endless filler trainer battles and the incessant wild encounters, a shockingly large amount of playtime is spent spamming the A button just to get back to the game. I understand the desire for the player's adventure to feel grand as a lengthy journey. Given harsh development constraints, the only real way to accomplish that impression is to slow the pace. This is something that never bothered me as a child, but as an adult my time is more precious, and I have very little patience when it is flagrantly wasted. The limitless supply of bugs in Viridian Forest do have a purpose in imparting valuable lessons to budding trainers. The two early bug lines, Caterpie and Weedle, seem to be tailor-built for the express purpose of conveying the concept of evolution. They both complete an entire three-stage evolution process by level 10, and their ties to real-world metamorphosis is something kids can easily grasp. Witnessing your team visibly grow beyond mere numerical stat increases is a profoundly satisfying experience. Furthermore, figuring out each Pokémon's evolution method and raising weaker Pokémon to their evolved forms is a fun way for kids to set and achieve small goals as they work to complete the Pokédex. 
The lessons don't stop there. Metapod and Kakuna, the middle stage Chrysalis Pokemon, invariably raise their defenses with the move Harden. It's important for new players to learn that even non-damaging moves can have a strong effect. Given how effortlessly these guys go down, I question the efficacy of the demonstration, but an attempt was made. After fighting dozens of Weedle, players are guaranteed to leave Viridian Forest with first-hand experience on the dangers of status ailments like poison. The takeaway? Never leave home without a healthy stock of medicine and potions at the ready. Just down the road from Viridian lies the entrance to Pewter City. The main attraction for the player will be the first gym of the game. This gym challenge will take the player across the entire region, and motivates much of the game's progression. In order to prove themselves a Pokémon Master, players must overcome all eight of the region's gym leaders, each specializing in a different Pokémon type. As with the Pokémon species names, I've got to commend the effort in tying each gym leader's name to their type of choice. That combined with their more exaggerated character designs creates a pretty memorable bunch. The Pewter City gym leader Brock commands a team of rock types, and offers a brutal lesson on type matchups. His Geodude and Onyx carry high defense stats, and crucially resist normal type moves, severely limiting your options for facing him. If you picked Bulbasaur or Squirtle, you should have a grass or water move by this point. Not only are these types super effective against rock types, they are also super effective against Onyx and Geodude's secondary ground typing, meaning grass or water moves will deal a whopping 4 times damage. If that wasn't enough, they also completely bypass Brock's defensive wall, by utilizing his team's lower special stat for damage calculations. New players might not understand all that detail, but it will be abundantly obvious that their chosen starter makes short work of Brock's team. It's all fun and games until we look at the Charmander or Pikachu experience. Brock's rock types resist fire moves, and are outright immune to electric types on their ground side. In red and blue, a Charmander player's only legitimate option for putting a dent into rock types is Butterfree's confusion move. Yellow mercifully added the fighting type Mankey to an early game route, and lowered the level requirement for Nidoran to learn the fighting type move Double Kick. Offering players a super effective option is an improvement over the Charmander experience, but even so it's unreasonable for a game that centers around personalizing your own unique team to practically invalidate all but one or two options. When you consider that the game's second gym is water type themed, weak to grass and strong against fire, the disparity in the Bulbasaur and Charmander experience is ridiculous. I acknowledge the game needs to throw your starter into unfavorable situations at some points to teach you about type matchups and incentivize a well-rounded team, but this design choice really sours the opening hours. The first two gyms will either be a total cakewalk, or the hardest challenge in the entire game, based essentially on a coin flip. By choosing Charmander, players are essentially selecting hard mode. I'm all for difficulty options, but players ought to at least know what they're signing themselves up for. The gyms are much more reasonable after the first few simply because the player has more options available to them. By the time a player challenges Blaine's late game fire gym, it's a pretty safe assumption that they will have added one of the many water type Pokemon to their team. No single option is forced, but many options are offered. Allowing players to craft their team according to which creatures strike their fancy is the ideal, instead of railroading them in a certain direction. Before long the opposite problem arises. The gym challenges cease to be a challenge. Strategy devolves into just using your highest base power super effective move repeatedly until the enemy goes down. NPC subpar AI, and the gym leader's insistence on monotype teams, offers non-existent counterplay to this brain-dead approach. If you have a super effective option, you win. If not, you either need to get one, or grind levels until you can overcome by brute force. This is a non-issue for young newbies, but I personally can't help feeling disappointed that the game never asks the player to think, and form new strategies. Too often, the game's biggest battles leave me profoundly underwhelmed at their simplicity. The way types interact in Pokémon and similar RPGs is often compared to rock-paper-scissors, something I'm guilty of earlier in this very video. It's a shorthand way to indicate the concept of intransitivity such that everyone understands without getting too technical. It's tricky to explain the idea that A beating B and B beating C doesn't necessarily imply that A beats C. But when you picture rock, paper, scissors, you instantly understand what I mean. Unfortunately, with 15 types, the interactions become much messier. One glance at the full matchup spread, and suddenly the comparison loses weight. 
Even still, each type has a set of strengths as well as weaknesses, so it should remain fair, right? While on paper this is true, in practice it couldn't be further from the truth. In Generation 1, the Psychic type in particular is laughably overpowered to the point where it completely dominates the metagame. For starters, the only type that resists Psychic moves is... other Psychic types. That's right, every single other Pokémon takes at least neutral damage, if not super effective damage. On the other side of the coin, per the official Nintendo matchup chart, Psychic types are weak to Bug and Ghost, meaning they take double damage from moves of those types. This is ultimately inconsequential, as there are essentially no strong Bug or Ghost type moves in existence, and very few formidable Pokémon that carry those types. Outside of a high roll pin missile, the strongest bug type move in existence is Twin Needle, with an effective 50 base power spread between two hits. Not particularly scary, especially when you consider the move is exclusive to Beedrill, who packs pitiful stats and is itself weak to Psychic, courtesy of its secondary poison typing. The only damaging ghost type move in the game is Lick, with a pitiful 20 base power, and the only ghost type Pokémon belong to the Gengar line which is, yet again, itself weak to psychic moves, due to a poison subtype. To add insult to injury, Nintendo's official type matchup chart is factually incorrect. Courtesy of a programming error, there are quite a few of those, the psychic type is actually immune to ghost types, instead of being weak to them as intended. Compare psychic's sole bug type weakness to the grass type's laundry list of weaknesses. Fire, ice, poison, flying, and for what it's worth, bug. Psychic's dominance doesn't end there. Types fall into two categories, physical and special. Physical moves use the attack and defense stats to calculate damage, while special moves just use the special stat. This stat is a two-for-one deal. A high special stat means a Pokémon can fire off high damage special attacks, and just as easily tank incoming special attacks. Clearly Pokémon that favor the special side here have an advantage, and you guessed it, Pokémon with the Psychic typing overwhelmingly sport massive special stats. Even with all these baked-in advantages, a type is only as good as its Pokémon. It's possible that this type dominance remains purely theoretical, if there were a dearth of viable Psychic types. Nope, there are more overpowered Psychic types than you could possibly fit on a team. Alakazam, Executor, Starmie, Slowbro, Jinx, Hypno, take your pick. And that's not even considering Mew and Mewtwo. Each of these Pokémon have extensive move pools, including access to the extremely solid 90 base power move Psychic, which, obviously, carries the Psychic type. With so many things working in Psychic's favor, at a certain point Game Freak loses plausible deniability. Like, how could they not notice this extreme disparity? This admittedly has limited effect on the in-game battles, the challenge never ramps up enough to demand an optimized team. However, balance issues like this have significant deleterious ramifications on PvP battles, both in a casual and competitive environment. Rock, paper, scissors loses its appeal when your opponent packs an unbeatable gun. After leaving Pewter City and making your way through another generic route of trainer battles, the player is faced with Mount Moon, the first dungeon of the game. These dungeons play by different rules than the standard routes. Here there is no avoiding wild Pokémon. Every single step risks an interruption from your exploration. Unless you liberally apply repels, these incessant encounters are a massive source of frustration. With so many forced battles, you'll be defeating more Zubat than you ever thought possible. What little ecological variety each dungeon possesses is quickly exhausted. At this point, random encounters only serve to annoy the player. It's a shame that dungeons are tainted by these frustrating mechanics, because otherwise they're an engaging test of the player's navigation ability, and are much more interesting in their design than the stock routes that make up most of the game world. As far back as I can remember, I've always had a fondness for corn mazes and mirror mazes in real life. This naturally extends into an affinity for maze-like environments in games like Zelda or Dark Souls. I'm not pretending Pokémon dungeons ever reach anything close to the ingenious designs found in those games, but they still grant me the satisfaction that arises as I slowly learn the layout without the aid of a map. Mount Moon is the simplest of these dungeons, but the complexity ramps up rapidly in Rock Tunnel, Pokémon Mansion, Victory Road, and the optional Seafoam Islands, Power Plant, and Cerulean Cave. The Rocket Hideout and Sylph Company fill the same void, but offer a merciful break from the wild encounters. Sylph in particular is a highlight, 
a massive 11-floor structure overtaken by Team Rocket, filled with warp tiles and locked doors that really makes you feel hopelessly lost. Speaking of Team Rocket, it's at this point that they are formally introduced. What little story exists in these games revolves around the downfall of Team Rocket at the player's hands. A video game story is generally intended to motivate the player to move forward, but I can't say the Team Rocket plotline accomplishes this at all. After our first encounter with a grunt stealing Pokemon fossils in Mount Moon, Rocket members regularly make appearances to stir up trouble and provide feeble excuse for filler content. Their modus operandi is about as shallow as you can get. Make money by exploiting Pokemon. There just isn't anything here to get invested in. It doesn't help that all of the Team Rocket members you fight carry practically identical teams. A small subset of the Pokemon roster are just permanently designated as Rocket Pokemon, and you'll fight these over and over with each of the seemingly endless grunts that block your way. However, all this time battling faceless Rocket grunts does lead to a pretty cool payoff when the identity of the 8th gym leader is revealed to be Rocket Leader Giovanni. Rematching him for the gym badge is a fun surprise, after defeating his mobster persona earlier. I'm trying to keep this retrospective to a manageable length, so I'm going to end the beat-by-beat -beat commentary at Mount Moon. To be brutally honest, there is so much repeated filler that it's best to analyze at a higher level while picking out some noteworthy moments. I just don't think I have the capability to recap each generic route in Mindless Trainer Gauntlet, and you certainly don't want to watch me try. I've repeatedly used the term generic to refer to the various routes that comprise much of the Kanto map, but that doesn't mean I hate them. Modeled after real-world Japan, these routes feel like an authentic time capsule of the rural countryside of Tajiri's youth. Something would be lost if each route offered flashy novelty. There is a level of beauty in the monotony. Nevertheless, I do still perk up when I arrive at a new town. Even if it's just a local gym, there is always something different to break up the journey. Most of these attractions are pretty poorly implemented when you look at them objectively, but even something like the Game Corner or the Safari Zone offers a fresh experience. Furthermore, I'm not one to turn down an opportunity to expand my Pokedex and team with some of the more elusive Mons. The genius of Kanto's layout is underappreciated if you ask me. A brief overview of the path we trod is in order. The leg from Pallet Town to Cerulean City is very straightforward, but after that there are many branching paths. Without playing the games themselves, it's not clear where one would actually progress from Cerulean. The game actually jumps you all over the place unpredictably from here, even after playing the game, it can be hard to remember the exact path we took. Players haven't obtained HM Cut at this point, so progress to the east is blocked by a solitary bush. Therefore, we head south, not to Saffron, but to Vermilion, through an underground tunnel that bypasses Saffron completely. The game sends the player in circles surrounding Saffron for quite a while, yet access to the city itself is restricted by guard shacks at each of the four entrances. From Vermilion, our progress to the east is blocked by a sleeping Snorlax blocking the path, so we must backtrack, through Diglett Cave if you wish, to Cerulean, where we can progress to the east with Cut. Side note, Cut and the other HMs, Surf and Strength, open up many optional areas with valuable items once obtained. The game rewards those who remember and return to the ability gates that previously eluded them. Other than the Rock Tunnel, it's a straightforward path from Cerulean to Lavender Town. This is probably the best place to touch on the game's music, because Lavender Town's theme is one of the most famous compositions. I'm far from a music expert, but I consider this soundtrack to be an incredible achievement given the hardware limitations. These are infectious tracks that effortlessly worm their way into your subconscious, and have proven timeless as they form the backbone of the musical identity for the entire series. Apologies for the tangent, but I didn't know where else to mention that. There isn't much we can do in Lavender for the time being, the Sylph Scope is necessary to deal with the restless spirits haunting the Pokémon Tower. That Sylph Scope is found in the Rocket Hideout underneath the Game Corner in Celadon City. Once again, we take advantage of an underground passage to bypass Saffron. Progress to the west is blocked by yet another sleeping Snorlax. Fortunately, the vending machines on the roof of the Celadon department store sell refreshing beverages that can be used to bribe the guards and finally enter Saffron. Fast travel through HM Fly isn't unlocked until Route 16, so all this navigation around the map is non-trivial. The roundabout connections between cities surrounding Saffron makes returning to any of them more difficult than you'd expect. Once Saffron is finally opened up and you can freely travel between these towns and cities, it's like a weight's been lifted from your shoulders. 
Return to Lavender Town and the Pokemon Tower with Sylph Scope in hand, and accept the Pokemon Flute in return for dealing with the spirits. This flute is our solution to the Snorlax problem, and opens up a fun little fork in the road. We can either wake the Snorlax by Celadon and head to Fuchsia by way of Cycling Road, or we can wake the one south of Lavender and enter Fuchsia from the east. Defeating Fuchsia's gym leader Koga grants players the ability to surf over bodies of water. Once again, we have two options for how to access Cinnabar. Most players will take the path from Fuchsia, but this path takes us through the tricky Seafoam Islands dungeon. A lazy but observant player could also head south from Pallet Town, where our adventure first began. I can't praise this progression path enough. You'd expect the first Pokemon game would feature a simple map and just send you from one town to the next in a straight line, but the developers were really forward-thinking here. Progression is still heavily directed, but the clever use of roadblocks makes it feel like the player is charting their own whirlwind path through the region. The games actually allow for a massive amount of non-linearity in the gym leader order, if you choose to seek it out. The directed progression naturally brings you to the gyms in the established order, but in most cases there is no requirement to actually beat the gym leader before moving on. Brock and Misty must always be the first two in that order, but from there it's left wide open. HM Cut is obtained on the SS Anne in Vermilion before fighting Lieutenant Surge, and is usable without beating him, so you could just skip him if you please. Erika, Koga, and Sabrina can also be tackled in any order. The only requirement for fighting Blaine is that you've earned the ability to surf from beating Koga, so you could slot Blaine in before Surge, Erika, or Sabrina if you really wanted to. Giovanni's gym, however, can only be challenged after the other seven badges have already been obtained. To sum it up, the only limits on the gym order are Brock must be first, Misty must be second, Giovanni must be last, and Koga comes before Blaine. Otherwise, the world is your oyster. The mathematically inclined among my audience might be interested to learn that, by using factorials, we can calculate the total number of possible gym orders as 5 factorial over 2, or 60 unique permutations. As with Ocarina of Time and Link to the Past, opportunities to create your own narrative like this are something I really respect, even if the vast majority of players will never take advantage of them. It's like the developers are giving you their blessing to sequence break. It's obviously appropriate for Giovanni to be the final gym challenge, but even beyond that I really enjoy how the game naturally loops you back around to Pallet and Viridian. You've had little reason to ever return up to this point, so it's possible the player hasn't spoken to their mom since the beginning of the game. Returning to your sleepy hometown, now one of the strongest Pokemon trainers in the region, really makes you appreciate the scope of your journey. There's only one place to go from here, the Indigo Plateau by way of Victory Road, conveniently waiting for you right where the adventure began. The Elite Four are the final test for any prospective Pokemon Master, essentially four more high-level gym leaders. The challenge is ramped up significantly because all four are fought back to back with no chance to rest up in a Pokemon Center until the gauntlet is over. It bothers me that with the eight gym leaders and the four Elite Four members, only 12 of the 15 total types are covered by a specialist. It would be so clean if every single type got representation, as is, just the Bug, Normal, and Flying types are absent with how much Game Freak clearly struggled to form varied teams for the more niche dragon or ghost types, it's curious that three of the most common types were left untouched. Once you finally limp over the finish line, having defeated Lorelei, Bruno, Agatha, and Lance in succession, the game has one more nasty surprise for you. Your rival Blue actually achieved his goal first, and one last battle is in order to determine who is truly the champion. This is one of the toughest fights in the game because Blue's team is high leveled and very well balanced with no shared weaknesses to prey on. We've watched Blue and his team grow throughout our shared adventure, so this battle comes packed with extra gravitas. The fight would be a great challenge even if the player entered the battle in tip-top shape. With their team in a weakened state from the previous four consecutive battles, players must muster up all their skill and determination if they hope to stand up to Blue. It will likely take a number of attempts but Blue can and will be defeated. Roll credits. If I'm being honest with myself, these games are difficult to return to today. Even excusing the amount of tedious filler, there are countless inconveniences baked into the core design that serve only to add frustration to the gameplay experience. The game moves at a sluggish pace, both in battles and in the overworld. The dreadfully slow walk speed is alleviated for the most part with the eventual acquisition of the bicycle, but the game arbitrarily restricts use of the bike inside dungeons or buildings. 
Bill's Pokemon PC is a nightmare to navigate with its non-existent UI, just nested text, and is nearly impossible to keep organized in any semblance of the word. The item bag is severely limited in size, which could be a potentially interesting design choice if not for the fact that the PC's item storage is just as restrictive. You'll frequently have to sell off even valuable items like TMs if you want to continue picking up new items. TMs are extremely precious, most are limited to a single use per playthrough, and many Pokémon depend on the moves they teach for a varied moveset. Clearly these are tools that ought to be saved for the perfect opportunity, which is directly at odds with the restrictive inventory system. Quality of life features are nearly non-existent. Even simple actions like surfing on a body of water directly in front of the player requires extensive menu navigation. It's hard to fault the fledgling dev team too much, but at the same time it's impossible to overlook how much the game gets in its own way. If you haven't touched red, blue, and yellow since the 90s, I can assure you that you have no idea of the extent that these games are broken. They are held together with duct tape and a prayer. Given how shoddy the programming is, it's a miracle they work at all. I'm not going to list every single broken mechanic. These bugs run rampant. We'd be here all day. I've already mentioned some of these earlier, like the psychic ghost interaction. But here is a small sampling of other juicy bugs as a taste. The move Focus Energy reduces your chance of a critical hit rather than raising it. Permanent stat buffs granted for earning certain badges are stacked whenever a boosted move is used, and it's possible for these stat boosts to get so high that they loop back around to zero. Hyper Beam's recharge turn is skipped if the opponent is KO'd, and a flying or digging Pokémon can become permanently invulnerable if the attack fails. These are clearly unintended interactions that make certain moves and strategies disproportionately strong. And then there are mechanics so poorly implemented you would swear that they're bugs, yet there is no evidence to suggest they weren't just bad ideas. Trapping moves like Wrap or Fire Spin can be used to infinitely lock and whittle down a Pokémon. Critical hits ignore stat changes, good or bad, and are tied to the speed stat, meaning a fast Pokémon like Persian can land a crit 99.6% of the time with Slash. A weird programming quirk means nothing is 100% guaranteed. Even 100% accurate moves will miss one time out of 256. Admittedly, some of the bugs actually enhance the fun. Missing No might be the most famous video game glitch of all time. By executing a specific, seemingly nonsensical series of actions, players can manipulate the game's internal RNG to force an encounter with a specific Pokémon. If the internal identifier doesn't match with any of the 151 existing Pokémon, this mess of pixels appears instead. The glitch Pokémon is even catchable, and appears in the Pokédex as a normal and bird type, despite the bird type not existing in-game. Encountering Missing Note corrupts the save game in all sorts of ways, including beneficial effects like setting the player's sixth inventory slot to a quantity of 128. Infinite Master Balls, anyone? This same glitch can be applied to encounter and capture any Pokémon, if the internal identification numbers are correctly manipulated, I couldn't resist the opportunity to actually use Mew in my in-game team. My purpose behind this video was to determine what caused these humble games to birth the biggest multimedia franchise in history. Now that we've taken an extensive look at the games, I could name countless areas where they fail, and yet the games succeeded beyond anyone's wildest expectations. Again I ask, what exactly makes these games so special? Is it the mechanical depth in Pokémon's take on JRPG combat? Nope. Even when the combat mechanics are functioning as intended, they remain surface level throughout. Is it the gripping story about taking out Team Rocket and overcoming the gym challenge? Obviously not. Don't make me laugh. It may go without saying, but I posit much of the Pokémon appeal lies with the Pokémon themselves. Who would have guessed? Artist Ken Sugimori's designs for the original 151 Pokémon are legendary. Critics may dismiss these early Pokémon as nothing more than exaggerated versions of real-life animals, but that's missing the point. The simplicity is what makes these Pokémon so appealing to both kids and adults. With a little imagination, you can easily picture these creatures existing in our world, and get lost in the fantasy. When I was young, I would frequently daydream of favorites like Rhyhorn racing alongside our family car, or a Gyarados leaping out of the ocean while spending time at the beach. Many Pokémon have creative inspirations that resonate with players even if they don't know the full backstory. The idea behind the lowly Magikarp, if given enough patient care and attention, transforming into the fearsome Gyarados, is pulled directly from Chinese myth. 
This set of 151 feels truly connected. They aren't just a random assortment of creatures. The shared design language, easier said than done, is instrumental in making them feel cohesive, but it's more than that. There is a large amount of pairing between different counterparts that tie them together. The Weedle and Caterpie line goes without saying, but you've also got the Vulpix and Growlithe lines, Oddish and Bellsprout, Jigglypuff and Clefairy, Diglett and Magnemite, Scyther and Pinsir, the two Nidorans, the two Hitmons, the Fossils, and obviously the legendary birds. Beyond these obvious pairings, there are so many interesting little details that lead to fan theories so grounded they must have some level of validity. Is it a coincidence that Gengar and Clefable have the exact same silhouette? Or that Cubone looks exactly like a baby Kangaskhan? My favorite is the theory that Ditto is a failed Mew clone. Ditto is found within the Pokemon Mansion where Mewtwo was created, and shares similar coloring as Mew, not to mention the exact same weight and shared exclusivity to the move Transform. There's no way details like that just line up by accident. Speaking of, I adore the way Mewtwo is built up in the player's mind with all these journal lore dumps. Hunting this ultimate life form down is a great post-game quest in the Cerulean Cave. It only works so well because players come to understand his story and significance long before coming face to face with the monster itself. The game's limited graphical capabilities and garish sprites, even after Pokemon Yellow's enhancements, can only do so much to sell these fantastical creatures to children. If only there was a collectible card game with lush art of what these primitive sprites were meant to evoke. Better yet, can you imagine if there was an entire anime adaptation that existed to fuel children's imagination and provide an idea of how these Pokémon actually might have moved, sounded, or battled? The anime may not be especially high art, but the Monster of the Week format fits Pokémon perfectly, and you can't knock that theme song. All of this is to say that these creatures aren't simply a set of pixels and numbers on a spreadsheet. To players, they are a living being just begging to be discovered. It's no surprise that our quest to catch them all was always more fulfilling than challenging the Elite Four or defeating Team Rocket. Everyone has their favorites, and the different teams that players choose form a sort of identity for each player. I couldn't resist throwing together a tier list of each fully evolved Gen 1 Pokémon to show off some of my own personal favorites. I'm sure this won't incite any sort of strife in the comments. I don't think there's too many hot takes, but someone out there is deeply offended right now, I can guarantee it. Yellow's Pikachu makes baby steps towards evolving the relationship between Trainer and Pokémon beyond just battling. This is something future games would continue to push. Regardless, even if battling is our sole interaction with our Pokémon, it's still hard not to fall in love with your chosen team. Pokémon isn't like other role-playing games. These aren't just generic monsters for your protagonist to defeat. They are imaginative and distinct creations to befriend as you carry out your adventure. Even more so than the creatures themselves, memories are formed through the interactions the games facilitate among siblings, friends, and classmates. Ironically, what truly sets Pokémon apart lies outside the games themselves. The single-player format can't offer sufficient challenge to motivate a player to spend 100 hours training their dream team to level 100. That drive to be the very best, like no one ever was, can only be found on the playground battling your similarly obsessed peers. The aforementioned balance issues and limited viable options don't even put a dent in players' desires to prove themselves. The player vs. player battle mode was so popular that Nintendo even shipped Pokémon Stadium, an N64 companion title where players could battle on the big screen with impressive, for the time, 3D models. Multiplayer battling was instrumental to the game's enduring appeal for sure, but I'd argue the ability to trade between games was the more important feature. I think many take for granted just how groundbreaking it is to enable one player to send bits of their save file over to their friend's save. The games are largely built in a manner that encourages this kind of trade negotiations between players. Each game has its own set of exclusive Pokémon that are impossible to catch in the other versions. And Ekans might be commonplace for a red version player, but, try as they might, blue players will never find one in the wild. Maybe they offer a Sand Shrew in exchange. Suddenly each player has expanded their collection with a new, rare to them, Pokémon. Not to mention sowing the seeds for a new friendship outside the game. Pokémon like the Starters, the Eevee Evolutions, and the Hitmons present the player with a choice and lock the other options away, once again incentivizing a tit-for-tat approach to trading. Teamwork is similarly essential in securing the powerful trade evolutions of Golem, Gengar, Alakazam, and Machamp. 
This is undeniably annoying for me, playing these games as an adult by myself a quarter century later, but it was magic for the target demographic at the time. This is something that is only possible on a handheld. The link cable seems tailor-built for this exact implementation, despite Pokemon releasing nearly a decade into the Game Boy's lifespan. Innovative ideas like this single-handedly revitalized the aging hardware. The in-game multiplayer modes are limited to battling and trading with friends, but I'd argue the exchange of information between players is an equally critical piece of the puzzle. In an age preceding the internet, these games were overflowing with mystery, and required players to pool their knowledge together if they wanted to uncover all the hidden secrets. The legendary birds Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres were intentionally hidden within optional areas, lying in wait for players to discover one night and then race to school to share with their friends. Can you imagine the look on your real-world opponent's face when you use your Mewtwo in a battle, a Pokemon he's read about but had no idea where to find? Chansey is only catchable in the Safari Zone, where it possesses a minuscule 1% encounter rate. Couple that with the many superstitions on how best to catch Pokemon within the Safari Zone, and you have a Pokemon whose very existence seems to be to get players talking to each other. And of course, who can forget the infamous Mew under the truck rumor? While the Generation 1 games may be difficult to return to, their core appeal remains timeless. 25 years ago or today, it makes no difference. Kids' imaginations are hungry for something to latch onto. Kids, and kids at heart, will always want to prove themselves to their peers, express their uniqueness through their team choices, and share in their mutual love of games. The early Pokemon games make countless silly fumbles, but they fundamentally understood what motivates players, and motivates humans as a whole, honestly. When your vision is that strong, the technical details cease to matter. You've already struck gold. Speaking of gold, this is the first entry in a new video series that will of course continue with the Generation 2 games, Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. As an amateur YouTuber, I'm obligated to remind you that you should subscribe to my channel to ensure you don't miss that video when it's eventually uploaded. I do ask for your patience, however, as my attention is split on this channel, with plans to continue covering the Legend of Zelda and Bioshock series as well. If you share my love for these franchises, check out those retrospective series too. Before you click away, I want to sincerely thank you for watching, and I'd love to hear your thoughts and memories on these Generation 1 games. To get the conversation rolling, which of the original 151 is your favorite? Special shout out as always to my patrons, Axel Deeker, Sarah Marguerite, Andreas Schouten, and Ian Dace. Your support honestly means the world to me. With all that being said, I think it's time for me to finally pack it up. Until next time, take care.